It is uh, very good to uh, see all of you here this evening. We're getting on into the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers is a book that has special significance for the church. Uh, that would strike a lot of people as sort of surprising because uh, if there's a title that uh, most people would find uh, uninteresting, it would be the title Numbers, you know, because most folks, uh, that, that reminds them of arithmetic, and apart from Wally Smith, I don't know a whole lot of people that that's just uh, uh, really get excited when they hear numbers. Well, the book of Numbers uh, has some numbers in it, but uh, it has many other things. It covers a span of most of the 40 years in the in the wilderness. It is really the story of the wandering of Israel in the wilderness. And the reason it has so much special significance for the church is because it is the story of Israel between the time they entered a covenant with God and the time they inherited the promised land. In other words, that's the story of the Christian life. You and I entered a covenant with God at baptism, and at the resurrection we will inherit the promises. And in between is where we find ourselves right now. So there is a, a very important correlation because Paul, in and we've gone through this recently in sermons, but the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 makes a special point of emphasizing that the things that happened to Israel in the wilderness were recorded and preserved as examples for us. Uh, they're types. Uh, they're illustrations. What we find in the book of Numbers are the same kinds of problems that have tended to beset the people of God collectively down through time. There are portions of the Bible that focus in on the problems we may encounter individually and personally in our personal lives. And there, there are things, you know, we, we all go through our, our trials, our difficulties, our adversities just on a personal level, individually, privately. But there are also things that we go through collectively, things that we go through in, in a corporate sense, and I mean that in the sense of, of as a body, uh, as, a, as a group. And the book of Numbers tells that story. There's a lot of interesting things here uh, during this period. It is uh, certainly we find in the book of Numbers the emphasis that the people of God can only move forward so long as they trust in God's promises and lean upon his strength. In other words, the just shall live by faith. And the book of Numbers shows why Israel of old did not inherit the promises at the time they could have. You know, Paul draws example from that in the book of Hebrews and talks about the fact that all that came out of Egypt with Moses did not enter in. Why? Well, they didn't enter in because of unbelief. And in Hebrews chapters 2 and 3, and getting on into chapter 4, the Apostle Paul keeps going back, emphasizing that Israel of old did not enter in. Uh, they did not enter in because of unbelief. And then he goes on and says that, uh, uh, you know, today, uh, if, if, you know, there's a promise left us of entering into uh, into his promises. And, and he talks about, the, the importance of, of today if you'll hear his voice. You see, that is an emphasis, that is something that, that we all our lives must, must uh, focus upon. Numbers is the record of Israel's lack of faith, and because of that unbelief, uh, they were unable to fulfill the calling that God had given them when they came out of, uh, out, out of Egypt. Um, the, um, so we want to uh, we want to focus on that as we as we open here in the book of Numbers. We're going to look a little bit at the story in the book of Numbers, chapter one. The Eternal spoke unto Mil uh, Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt. So here we are. Uh, they had just erected the tabernacle. We saw that at the end of Exodus. Leviticus is primarily instructions to the Levitical priesthood, the story of holiness, as we saw last time. 
Moses is now told to take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with the number of their names, every male uh, by their poles or by their heads from 20 years old and upward. And so uh, we uh, find the leaders of each of the tribes uh, that are mentioned. Uh, I would call your attention in uh, verse 7 to Nashon, uh, who was the uh, son of Amenadab, who was the leader or the prince of the tribe of Judah. And uh, as you go on through the story, you find that uh, he had a son by the name of Salmon, who is mentioned later on, and uh, that was the father of Boaz, uh, who is mentioned in the book of Ruth. So we're looking at Boaz's grandfather uh, here, and therefore the ancestor of King David, but he was, uh, this was the line, let's say the leadership line, uh, there was a prince or, or chief of each of the tribes. Uh, one of the things we do find as we go through the book of, uh, not only the book of Numbers, but, but any of the uh, this section of scripture, we find that God is a God of organization. Uh, can you imagine having what must have been at least two to three million people uh, out there, and they just sort of wander around in this big mob scene? Uh, you know, it's taken a lot longer than 40 years to have gotten across the desert. Uh, one of the things we're going to see as we go on, it's very interesting, God had them organized uh, in a precise way, and, and that... I think is an important concept that God is a God of order and we find that there is structure in his entire kingdom. When you go to the book of Revelation, when you look at any areas that describe the, the heavenly realm, we find uh, we, we find patterns. Uh, it, it's interesting, you know, there because there are patterns that follow through. And we're going to see some right here in the book of Numbers in terms of the way things are organized. But I just call one to your mind. Uh, you know, you go to the book of Revelation and you read uh, that sitting around God's throne are the 24 elders. You realize later when David organized the priests, he organized them into 24 courses, and there were 24 priests who were the chief of the houses of their fathers. They were organized into 24, 24 groups, 24 courses of the priests, uh, accompanied by 24 courses of Levites. Uh, you know, I I the 24 elders, we're not given all the details, but undoubtedly, uh, there are uh, perhaps, uh, you know, there is a, a structure. There, there, pro there are uh, 24 courses, uh, if you want to use that term, of, uh, in the angelic realm. There, there are 24 elders, 24 uh, angelic beings that occupy uh, a very uh, high position around the throne of God, and you read of that. There, there is a structure. There is a parallel. In fact, <clears throat> what we will find as we look at the book of Numbers in terms of, of what God built in uh, to the nation, we will find that it is a pattern of what we read in the book of Revelation uh, with the structure of God's government for eternity. Um, come on, we'll come on down. I'll, I'll show you that. Uh, the uh, goes through here the tri the the organization of it. And then they assembled and they took the count and we have the numbers of, of the tribes. Judah was the uh, largest of the uh, of the tribes, uh, almost 75,000 men, 74,600 um, uh, of the men. That's in verse 27. Uh, we come on through in chapter 1 and it gives all of the, uh, um, uh, all of this number. The Levite, verse 47, weren't numbered among them. Uh, they were to be organized differently. Now, we're told, uh, verse 51, when the Levite, when the tabernacle sets forward, the Levite shall take it down. When the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levite shall set it up. The stranger that comes near shall be put to death. The children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp, every man by his own standard throughout their hosts. The Levite shall pitch around about the tabernacle of testimony, that there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel. The Levite shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of testimony. Now, you see, the whole nation had the opportunity to become a nation of priests uh, when the covenant at Sinai was proposed, but if you remember the story, they didn't even last six weeks. Uh, they made the golden calf, and in the aftermath of that, the Levites were set aside. And as we're going to see here, 
the Levites took the place of the firstborn. And this was the, the Levitical priesthood. The Levites actually took the place of the firstborn. And uh, we, we will see that here uh, in uh, just a, a matter of, uh, um, uh, of moments that, uh, uh, that is the, uh, is the, um, the setup as we come on down here in, in, uh, uh, chapters, uh, uh, in chapter four where we, uh, uh, we go through the, uh, uh the Levites. And, uh, but, uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, what we find here in, uh, chapter two, uh, see, God had the tabernacle set. The Levites camped around the tabernacle. Now, he said they were to pitch their camp, their, they, they were to pitch their tents by their own camp, by their own standard. You know, we had a whole lot fewer people to organize. For a number of years, I was the camp captain in Big Sandy uh, for the Feast of Tabernacles, and we had upwards five, 6,000 people camped on the ground. We had more than that, sometimes 10,000 attending the feast, but we had uh, uh, upwards of 6,000 camped in the piney woods. Now, can you imagine if everybody just sort of showed up and pitched the tent wherever he felt the urge to pitch a tent? Uh, you had thousands of tents out there uh, and campers and everything else. Well, you can't do that. You, you, you can have, uh, uh, you, you know, God's the, the, the God of order. So before people ever showed up, we had a lot number assigned to them. They knew uh, we, we had the campground laid out with streets and lot numbers, and we first organized it by church areas. I would go up there ahead of time, months ahead, uh, would get the, the registration list, would go through, would organize the thing out by church areas. We had captains of 1,000, captains of 100, captains of 50, uh, captains of 10. We just used the pattern. You know, it was real uh, sort of a, didn't have to invent a new system, just look at the one God gave and say, well, you know, that was, if it was good enough for the camp of Israel, so you, you had a structure to where we had a city of five or 6,000 people that, that literally occurred overnight. And yet we were organized. We had a structure to take care of everything from sanitation and, and cleaning the bathhouses and uh, trash disposal and, and uh, somebody to, uh, you know, to help out on, on different things. Well, God instructed him here. They, the tabernacle was in the midst. The Levites were right around it. The children of Israel were camped in a square around. There were three tribes on the north, three on the uh, east, three on the south, three on the west. And on each side, there was a flag that was flying that represented that, that side, the north side, the west side, east side. See, and it's spelled out. Verse 3, on the east side, toward the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch. The standard was the flag. So the flag of Judah was raised, and then uh, the uh, uh, Nashon, the uh, uh, son of Amenadab, he was the captain over that, that section. And the ones that pitched next to them uh, were Issachar, verse 5, and Zebulun. They were all on the east. And then on the south side, uh, moving right around, uh, verse 10, uh, the standard of the camp of Reuben, according to their armies. And uh, they, their, their flag was flying. And then verse 12, Simeon, and verse 14, Gad, were there with them on the south side, three tribes on the south. And then uh, uh, on the west side, uh, verse 18, the standard of the camp of Ephraim. And uh, then we find in verse 20 in, uh, that Manasseh and verse 22, Benjamin, were camped there uh, on the west side with him. And then uh, verse 25, the standard of the camp of Dan will be on the north side. So their flag was flying on the north. And Asher, uh, verse 27, and Naphtali, verse 29, were uh, there on the north side. Now, let's stop for a second. Let's look at two things. The, the history and tradition preserves the flags of the four tribes. Judah's flag was a lion, and that's the symbolism that's used for Judah. Uh, Reuben was a man. Uh, Ephraim was a bull or an ox. Dan was an eagle. Now, that's interesting. If you go to the book of Ezekiel, and if you go to the... Where did, God, where did they come up with those? Uh, why was it organized that way? Why those four? Well, let me just tell you sort of an interesting little coincidence. If you go to Ezekiel 1, or if you go back to the book of Revelation, 
in uh, uh, the first few chapters, and you read that there are creatures, there are four creatures around God's throne that have four faces. Uh, you know, it strikes us sort of odd to have four faces, but uh, they have four faces. They have the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle. In fact, if you read the way they're described, it goes around in the same pattern. So, uh, then when you go back to the end of the book of Revelation, you read about the, the heavenly city comes down, the new Jerusalem, it, it, the city is four square. And guess what? There are three gates on each side. Those twelve gates. And each gate has the name of one of the tribes of Israel. And of course, what's in the midst? Well, God and the Lamb are in the midst of the city, that's what we're told. What was in the midst here of the encampment? The tabernacle, which had the Holy of Holies, which was the symbolic of the very presence of God, overshadowed by a cloud, with a cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. God placed his presence there. God was in the midst, and he was surrounded in that same way. There's a pattern. See, God sets a pattern, and here we have a structure of, of the way God organized ancient Israel, and there was a there was a march order. When the time came, you see, the the uh, as as the trumpet was blown and they went out, and then uh, the the first two try the first two sections left, and then the Levites came there in the middle with the uh, uh, you know with the uh, bearing the ark and all the things connected with the tabernacle, and and then the tribes that were there toward the end, and so you had this huge procession. Of course, they they weren't marching single file. Uh, they obviously were spread out. You'd never get a million people somewhere if they were all lined up, uh, you know, behind one another. They had livestock to transport and all sorts of things. But uh, the point is, they there was an organized pattern. There was there, there was precision. There was harmony, and that is characteristic of God's way. Uh, God's structure is set up. Uh, it, as a means of of teaching us about God and about the whole pattern that that He wants forever, and uh, so it's interesting. You see this pattern that Israel had, and uh, the children of Israel were told uh, in verse thirty four that according to all that Moses command, the Lord commanded Moses, so they pitched by their standards. They set forward one after. Everyone after their families, according to the house of their fathers. So they were organized in a uh, in, in a way that way. Uh, um, you know, this is uh, it, it was a it was a structure. It was based on the family, and the family grew large. Uh, I think it gives us some insight into the world to come and and the structure that's set up. Not that we're all going to be living in tents, or that human beings are going to be living in tents, but you. You know things are organized out. We'll see when we came into the pro when they come into the promised land uh, that ultimately when it was time to inherit, uh, God had Joshua uh, choose lots to assign the different tribes their inheritance, and then each family within that tribe was assigned. You know it wasn't like the Oklahoma land rush where they all lined up at the line and took off, and the guy that was the fastest and strongest uh, got the best plea, it got the best piece, and the fellow that was sort of slow. Uh, came dragging up the rear and found out there wasn't anything left. Uh, you know, God had a pattern where he assigned things out, and and uh, each family was given their their portion. Then, obviously, uh, whether they were productive and how hard they worked and, and whether or not uh, they uh, managed well and all these things would determine you know, some would, would prosper more and others would, would fall on hard times. But God gave everyone an opportunity. And uh, you, you find that pattern that is there. And I think it's interesting how God organized uh, how God organized Israel. And we, we see that. Uh, so then we find the uh, uh, that... Uh, uh, what God told uh, told Moses here in chapter three, that uh, in in verse six, bring the tribe of Levi near, present them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister unto him. They shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation to do the service of the tabernacle. And 
The, uh, uh, so we find this instruction, verse 12, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that opened the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. So, uh, so we find here, you see the firstborn are mine, verse 13, uh, because God smote the firstborn in the land of Egypt. And uh, uh, the Levites were chosen instead. So they numbered the children of Levi, uh, verse 15, numbered them according to the word of the Lord, and it goes through uh, all of that and uh, comes on down uh, of these uh, particular uh, of these particular sons and it gives all of the uh, uh, the uh, details and we're told that the number of Levite verse 39 was uh, 22,000 uh, then God told Moses in verse 40 number the firstborn of the males of the children of Israel from month old and upward and so they numbered those and they found that there were, uh, verse 43, 22,373. Uh, so then, the Le take the Levites, instead of all the firstborn, this is what we're told in verse 45, and uh, then uh, this 273, uh, in excess, mentioned in verse 46, uh, they were to be redeemed at the cost of five shekels a head, and uh, the money was to be given to Aaron and to his sons, and so uh, uh, this was this was carried out. Now we find organizing here the uh, Levites in terms of their function uh, by their families spelled out in uh, chapter four, uh, where we uh, go through each of the uh, individual groups. Uh, what we find is that 30 years of age was the age of full service. Uh, chapter four, verse three, from 30 years old and upward, even until. It, <coughs> even until 50 years old all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation there was a lot of physical work in terms of uh, in the wilderness of, of transporting and carrying these various articles of furniture uh, the uh, whole process of sacrificing which was you know being a butcher I mean, you, you, you were slaughtering animals, you were uh, skinning them, you were uh, separating out the, the, the pieces and the portions of it, you were, you know, heaving chunks of meat up on the, uh, the altar, you were uh, doing various things. There was a lot of physical uh, work uh, that was involved. What we find is that the Levites began, uh, other scriptures show uh, that they functioned in an apprentice capacity beginning at 25 had uh, entered into full service, as it brings out here at age 30, a function that way up until 50. Now, after age 50, other scriptures show that the Levites functioned also as judges and uh, as uh, teachers and various things. I think the, the impression is that uh, after age 50, they were not uh, involved so much in the, uh, the, the physical aspect of, of uh, the things that... Uh, um, Put an, act, uh, put an emphasis on uh, physical uh, stamina and strength. And if you uh, uh, ever tried to dress out a young ox, uh, you would realize that uh, it, you know you're looking at something that's a pretty physical job. Uh, they're heavy. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, you know taking several men to try to heave something like that around. You're splitting it up. You're, you're you are separating off the head, and you're skinning it out and taking the skin and doing one thing. You're doing all these uh, various things. So you're looking at, at a lot of uh, hard work just from a physical standpoint. And uh, so anyway, the structure is given here and it goes through and talks about the uh, way in which the uh, ark and all of these things were transported. They were covered with certain uh, coverings. It was, it was, the, there was an emphasis to show respect for God, because the things of God, the articles of furniture of the tabernacle, the ark in particular, but all of the articles of furniture of the tabernacle, uh, were associated with God, and proper respect was shown to the holiness of God. All of these ceremonies were to impress upon them the fact that uh, uh, this matter of reverence and respect to be shown toward God. And 
where God has placed his presence, the tabernacle and, and the things there, the holy place, the holy of holies, uh, they were to, uh, to be deeply impressed, to not treat cheaply and casually that which pertains to God, matter of reverence. Uh, the, uh, there are various uh, uh, matters as we, uh, uh, as we go through chapter 6, deals with the question of the Nazarites. <clears throat> the Nazarites were individuals, men who, uh, men or women who separated themselves, uh, verse 2 of chapter 6, to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. So it was a special vow of dedication. Uh, it could last for various lengths of time. We read in the scriptures of, uh, several individuals, three that come to mind right off, who were Nazarites from their mother's womb. Uh, Samson was a Nazarite, or he was dedicated to be a Nazarite from his mother's womb. Uh, Samuel was a Nazarite from his mother's womb. Uh, John the Baptist was a Nazarite from his mother's womb. You read of others uh, who took the vow, in fact, in the book of Acts, uh, you read of of individuals, uh, some individuals who had taken this vow and Paul went with them into the temple. They were, they, their vow was at an end. And it spelled this out. It was a day, it was days of separation. Uh, chapter 6 verse 3, uh, they were uh, not to drink wine or strong drink, uh, nor anything that, that came, you see, from grapes. Uh, they could, they not to eat grapes, not to eat raisins, not to, uh, uh, use vinegar from, from wine, not to use wine or strong drink. Uh, that was uh, uh, nothing came from the grapes, uh, verse 4, from the kernels to the husk. Uh, so they, they were separated from that. Uh, they, verse 5, uh, no razor was to come upon their head during the days of their separation. Um, the, uh, their hair grew uh, without being cut. And verse 6, uh, they were not to touch a dead body. Uh, the, all the days Verse 8 of the separation, he's holy to the Lord. And uh, then it goes through as to how at the end of this time of separation, uh, he comes to the tabernacle, the Levite, the Nazarite uh, brought a particular offering. His hair and his beard were shaved. Uh, that was presented as an offering. Uh, that's mentioned down in verse 18. And uh, uh, then a uh, particular sacrifice. And this is the law of the Nazarite. Now, Jesus Christ was not a Nazarite. John the Baptist was. Uh, Christ was uh, called a Nazarene. That has to do with the city of Nazareth where, where he lived, uh, but it has no connection with the word Nazarite. They're just similar-sounding words in, in, uh, in English, but uh, uh, this was a particular vow. Uh, generally, people would take it upon themselves for a period of, you know, 60 days, 90 days, uh, you know, six months, a year, something of that sort. It was a temporary uh, thing that had to do with being set aside for special service to God, and uh, then it was, uh, you know, it was concluded. Um, interesting, and in, in just the closing here. This is a, a uh, chapter twenty or verse twenty-two. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel. Uh, the priests were." Uh, given a blessing that they were to uh, use. You know, there is not a functioning Levitical priesthood among the Jews today. There has not been since the temple was destroyed. But the priests, there, there are many among the Jews who are recognized as priests. The word Kohen is the Hebrew word for priest. Uh, everywhere you read Aaron the priest, it's just Aaron uh, HaKohen, uh, Aaron the Kohen. Uh, any Jew whose name is Kohen, uh, and it can be spelled various ways because remember they didn't use the vowels they used the, the consonants uh, K-H-N in Hebrew so C-O-H-E-N or K-U-H-N uh, you know a variety of ways uh, Cohen, uh, Kuhn, uh, Cohen uh, various ways that it's spelled but they are recognized as priests they are recognized as they, they are a Cohen they have preserved that uh, uh, that name of uh, setting them aside, uh, because their name in Hebrew, you know, if somebody's name is uh, 
Samuel Cohen, uh, that just means Samuel the priest. And uh, uh, in an Orthodox synagogue, uh, any Cohen who is present, uh, a, a male uh, Cohen, if he is present, is called upon. This is one of the two or three things left that they have done since the temple is, has been destroyed. But if a Cohen is present, then at the conclusion of the service, he comes forward and recites uh, this uh, this blessing. He's the only one, uh, only a Cohen can uh, recite that uh, there in the synagogue. Uh, the, this was the blessing by which the priest Aaron and his sons, real, all priests descend from Aaron. Uh, the Levites included the whole tribe, but uh, all of the priests uh, were descendants of Aaron. So it started out, you see, only Aaron and his sons. So the pre number of priests was very small. As the generations went by, the number of priests uh, grew in multitude. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. You know, I, I think this is an interesting blessing to go back and meditate on, just in terms of, of its significance and what it means uh, to have God's blessing. We ask God's blessing, and when we ask God's blessing, this is really what we're, we're asking. Uh, that God would bless you and keep you, make his face to shine on you, uh, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance and give you peace. Uh, so, in chapter 7, we have the uh, setting up here of the uh, uh, tabernacle and then the offerings that were given uh, are spelled out the prince of each tribe came forward uh, with the uh, uh, with the offerings and uh, then the Levites were consecrated in chapter 8 uh, chapter 9 brings up an interesting matter and this is the uh, second Passover the uh, pass there were some individuals who were defiled uh, ceremonially and were uh, unable to keep the uh, Passover at the appointed time. They were not uh, they did not meet the uh, criteria that was given and so God instructed Moses that if someone were uh, unable because of a journey uh, they were somewhere <coughs> And uh, were uh, you know in transit, so that that could of course uh, occur. Things uh, happen, and uh, or they were defiled and unable to uh, participate. That there was a second Passover. Uh, this is uh, the first eleven verses. Uh, verse eleven, the fourteenth day of the second month at evening they shall keep it. And so we follow that principle today in the church and and. Uh, Occasionally, there's someone who may, uh, for legitimate reason, be unable to attend the Passover, and, and so there is a second Passover. The uh, uh, chapter 11 uh, goes through the uh, details of how they they uh, went forward. It talks about the trumpets of silver uh, and the uh, way in which they were to blow the. You know, they didn't have telephones. They didn't have uh, all the modern means of communication. How do you communicate, you know, with a large group like this? How do, uh, how do people know when it's time to go forward or when various things happen? Well, they had certain codes in terms of these trumpets that were blown that were uh, used for the calling of an assembly. And uh, uh, it uh, they, they were to blow an alarm. And uh, uh, the... Uh, sons of Aaron also uh, verse 10 also in the days of your gladness and in your solemn days in the beginning of your months you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offering <coughs> you know there are individuals um, who have gotten off in uh, wanting to devise their own calendar decide that the one that the church uses uh, you know they'll go out and sort of look at the moon and decide for themselves when the beginning of the moon uh, the month is well God never told the Israelites to go out and sort of look at it. When you think it's, it's the new moon, well, you just consider, you know, everybody figure his own holy days out. The, you know, Leviticus 23, Moses was told, these are the festivals of the eternal, which you shall proclaim in their season. So it was the responsibility of Moses or those who uh, were, in that sense, the successors of Moses 
to proclaim those days in their seasons. The Levites were instructed to blow the trumpet. To, this is the way they announced it. They proclaimed it. There was a... Uh, you've got to have order and structure. I would guarantee you if you told everybody, okay, uh, everybody just, you know, sort of figure out the beginning of the month, you know, best you can. I'll guarantee you, you'd have no telling how many different days that, that would be being celebrated because... Uh, Somebody would, you know, be sure. Well, I didn't, I didn't see it. You know, I didn't, didn't look like a new moon to me. I didn't see anything. Oh, I, I saw it yesterday. Well, I didn't see it yesterday. I, you know, I saw it uh, uh, today. And and uh, you, you just, I mean, that's the case. What 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 if it's cloudy? What if it's raining? Uh, you you know, you, well, what if you can't see anything? You know, you ever notice sometimes you got days of stretch where you you can't see the stars, you can't see the moon. All you can see is. Uh, clouds, so maybe it's uh, raining, it's a thunderstorm. You know, God's not the author of confusion. He set up a system. He gave uh, through uh, Moses and Aaron and the priesthood, he gave instructions in terms of how these things were to be uh, were to be done, and the priests announced it uh, to everyone uh, month by month, and, and they had, uh, they had a, a cycle that was set up. It was just a pattern. We, uh, as we come on forward in chapter 11, we find the, uh, uh, that uh, the people were complaining. People were complaining, uh, and uh, God heard it, and his anger was kindled, uh, Numbers 11, verse 1. And uh, notice it consumed them that were in the uttermost part of the camp, in, in the verse 1. Uh, it's sort of interesting Anytime you get a group together, you know, we use the term today, you sometimes we refer to somebody, we refer to people as being fringers. Well, this is sort of where the concept comes from. You know, the tabernacle was right in the middle. And so there were people who wanted to be close. And there were others that really wanted to be as far away from God, where God was as they could. They were on the edge. And I don't think it's, uh, surprising that where probably the most complaining was going on was people that were in the uttermost edge of the camp. They were over here on the periphery. Uh, it sort of wandered off, you see, and uh, uh, they were all over there writing and complaining. There was an attitude. That's what God was displeased with, was their attitude. They were, uh, they had this uh, this attitude of lust. They were dissatisfied. Uh, they fell a lusting, we're told, verse 4. Uh, verse 5, they began to rewrite history. You know, isn't it amazing how people began to reflect back and they said, you know, we didn't have it so bad down in Egypt. Now, back when they were in Egypt, they thought they had it pretty bad. But they got to thinking back and said, you know, we had a lot more variety in the food. We're sick and tired of the stuff God's been giving us. Now, you know, that needs to teach us that we want to have an attitude of being thankful and appreciative. It's not wrong to go to God and ask in the right attitude and the right spirit. For, for certain things, but we want to appreciate and to value the, the blessings God gave us. You know, they were hungry and didn't have anything. God gave them manna. Well, a while went by, and then they decided, well, they were glad to get it when they first got it, but then after a while it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, exactly the way they wanted to do it. And uh, God uh, uh, then... Uh, uh, God... Well, Moses went to God and said, uh, verse 11 of chapter 11, Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore have you afflicted your servant? Uh, what have I not found favor in your sight that you laid the burden of all this people upon me? Moses was at his wit's end. He said, I obviously have really done something that has displeased you, God. I'm not sure what it was, but I wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't lay all this on me if I hadn't really, uh, you know, whatever it is, let me know. I'd like to straighten it out. And, uh, uh, Moses was uh, sort of at his wit then, and uh, God uh, gathered 70, told Moses to gather 70 of the elders of Israel, and he uh, poured out or gave his spirit to them, and they were able, therefore, to give Moses more assistance. Now, in chapter 12, we have the uh, uh, case of Miriam and Aaron trying to stir up problems. Uh, they were jealous. You know, human nature has not changed. They were jealous of Moses. They were jealous of his stature uh, among the people. 
And they felt like, well, who's Moses? He's our little brother. It's hard to look up a little brother. Uh, Miriam said, well, I remember when you were just a little baby, and I used to take care of you, and I changed your diapers, and I, wa you know, watched you when you were out in a little, uh, you know, a little basket floating on the mine. And uh, Aaron, of course, was two or three years older than Moses. And evidently, they had just uh, sort of chafed a little bit and decided uh, that uh, they spoke against Moses, chapter 12, verse 1, because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now, let me mention a little bit about this. This is the only mention of this Ethiopian woman uh, we're not told any details. The, uh, this was an event that had happened in the past, and it was thrown up in Moses' face in front of the congregation. So it was obviously something that everybody recognized as not a good thing. And uh, Mary and Aaron brought it up uh, in a way to uh, uh, put Moses down in the eyes of the people. Uh, it was something that had happened in the past. Josephus, the Jewish historian and priest of the first century, uh, recounts, the, uh, the event is having occurred during the 40 years when Moses was a prince of Egypt. And he gives the story of the siege of Mero, which was a, uh, an Ethiopian fortress, and, and Moses. Uh, all we know of Moses' career as an, Ethio as an Egyptian prince uh, from the Bible is in Acts 7. Stephen says Moses was a man mighty in words and deeds among the Egyptians. But he doesn't elaborate on what those words and deeds are. You don't read of them in Exodus. Uh, Josephus describes a number of those words and deeds uh, that Moses accomplished among the Egyptians, and uh, that was evidently the occasion of his having married this Ethiopian woman. Uh, he, when he left Egypt, uh, had left by himself, later was married uh, to a Midianite woman. The Midianites, of course, were descendants of Abraham. This was the daughter of Jethro, and you read about her in the book of Exodus. But Moses, or Aaron and Miriam, have dragged this thing up that happened way in the past, and uh, they spoke against him because of this and began to try to put him down in the eyes of the people. And the Lord spoke suddenly to Moses and Aaron and Miriam and called them into the tabernacle, and God dealt with them very uh, severely. He says, why weren't you, uh, you, you know, why weren't you uh, afraid to speak against my servant Moses, verse 8? Why didn't you have more respect? Uh, the anger of the Lord was kindled against you. Now the problem, you, you know, it's God never addresses, as you go on through chapter 12, some want to take this out of context and use it for other uh, things, God never addressed the subject of the, of the Ethiopian woman that Moses had married years earlier. Uh, he did not say it was a good thing, he didn't... Uh, Defended, he didn't make any comment about that. That wasn't the issue in God's mind. Miriam and Aaron were looking for something that they could embarrass Moses with in the eyes of the people, sort of put him down. You know, it's sort of a, isn't it a, an amazing fact of human nature? People think if they can put somebody else down, somehow that raises them up. If they can embarrass someone, it's like, well, that sort of makes me a little better. Well, God saw an attitude, and he dealt with that attitude. Uh, there was a lack of respect toward Moses, whom God had chosen, in uh, trying to embarrass and humiliate him in front of the people to sort of put him down. And uh, in reality, you see, God took it personally. That, why weren't you afraid to speak against my sermon? I put him there. I'm the one who chose him. Why weren't you afraid to do that? Well, you know, that... Uh, that, that, that is an, an interesting lesson. Now, as we come on down in chapter 13, we find that Moses was uh, told to choose out a leader of each one of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, tribes, of, uh, uh, the tribes of Israel that uh, were to go into the promised land as spies. He sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, chapter uh, uh, 13, verse 17. And they did, and they went through the land, and they brought back their report, and they said, well, it's a wonderful land. It's just like, uh, it is uh, uh, just like God said, except 
They're giants in the land. Oh, you know, it, they brought back uh, fruit and, and the cluster of grapes was so heavy it took two of them to carry it. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, but they're obstacles. You know, God calls us to inherit a great blessing, but you know what we find? There are obstacles that lie in our pathway. Now, there's no obstacle that's too big for God to deal with, but that takes faith. And what we find in chapter 13 and 14 is the spies came back and 10 out of the 12 were lamenting and said, oh, there are giants in the land. It's no good. We better turn around and go home. You know, an attitude of absolute lack of faith. God has brought them out here. They've lost sight of God. Now we look at that and we think, how ridiculous. Why don't they see all that God did for them? And now they're afraid to go forward because they're giants in the land. Well, you know, all sorts of great things. But we find obstacles coming along, people forgetting what God has done and beginning to, to lament. So we find, you know, they were ready to elect a, a new leader, in chapter 14, verse 4. Let us make a captain and let's return to Egypt. And Moses and Aaron fell on their face before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And, uh, you know, Moses and Aaron went before God over and over. And uh, they asked God to intervene. And God fought their battles. So we find the story here in uh, uh, chapter uh, 14. And we're told, uh, God said, in verse 30 of chapter 14, uh, You shall not come into the land where I have sworn to make you dwell, except Caleb and Joshua, <clears throat> your little ones, that you said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land you've despised. As for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness. Your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, bear your whoredoms, until their carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities forty years, and you shall know my breach of promise. We find this principle of a day for a year brought out here. We also find it back in the book of Ezekiel that uh, uh, in this, this pattern, again, we find this period of, of time, this 40 days. Well, as we, uh, uh, as we uh, come on down in uh, uh, certain details of, of the offerings are given here in chapter 15, verse 16, we read about Korah. Now, you know, we've got a little ways down the road from, from uh, the problems with not going into the promised land. Here's Korah, who's Moses' cousin. And he's gotten together with some of his buddies, Dathan and Abiram. Verse 2, they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord's among them. Wherefore then lift you up yourselves above the congregation. You know, sort of a demagogue approach. They came before Moses, and you know, a big crowd gathered around. They said, why all these people are holy? What makes you think you're something? You're just trying to be a dictator. You set yourself up above everybody else. Well, as you come on through the story, chapter 12, or verse 12, Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, and they said, we won't come up. Well, you can talk about a couple of smart alecks. They, they weren't even going to, they're not even going to show up. You know, is it a small thing? Verse 13, you brought us out of a land that flowed with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except now you make yourself a prince among over us. They said, you have not brought us into a land that flows with milk and honey. You've not given us an inheritance. You're going to, you know, interesting how all of a sudden the facts are twisted. You promised to lead us into a land flowing with milk and honey, and we're out here in the desert. That's true. And what they neglected to mention is that they wouldn't go into the land that God had led them to because they were, you know, because of the bad report. But it's amazing. You know, history all of a sudden gets rewritten, and here are people standing there nodding, yeah, yeah, you know, Dathan and the Bible got a point there. I hadn't thought of that. 
You, you can just see it. Human nature, just here it is. And, and it's all the way down. Uh, so God made it distinct. He taught, um, the uh, upshot of the thing, of course, is that uh, uh, God swallowed up Korah and Dathan and Abiram and everything that pertained to them. And uh, they went down into the pit, verse 33. So, as we uh, as we come on down the uh, the story, verse 41, on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and said, "You killed God's people. You sure were hard on those four on those four folks. Poor old Korah, he was a nice guy, and you you you, you know I just can't believe you you were just so rough." Well, Moses didn't sw- open the ground up. God did. They left that point out. Well, the uh, there was a plague that was sent out. And, uh, uh, in fact, uh, 14,700 died in the plague, uh, verse, uh, verse 49. And uh, we find that uh, God then told Moses to take rod, to have the prince of each tribe present a rod. And they did. And... Uh, the rod of Aaron, uh, as the prince of Levi, was included, and all twelve rods were laid up there in the tabernacle. And the next day, they were gotten out, and we find that uh, Aaron's rod, which was made out of almond wood, uh, had uh, put out little branches and blossomed and, you know, budded out and borne out almonds. It had borne fruit, and it was clearly distinct from all the others. That was ultimately laid up before the ark as a witness, as a record. You know, God had God chooses whom he will. God chose Aaron and, and uh, his family. And uh, we find that story given here in chapter 17. Uh, chapter 18, uh, God told Aaron, you and your sons, your father's house, with you, verse 1, shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, and you and your sons shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. And it goes on down uh, what they were to do, and uh, uh, that uh, they were uh, given that uh, um, they were given charge of the sanctuary, charge of the altar, verse 5, and the Levites were uh, given there to them to do the service of the tabernacle. And uh, uh, as we As we uh, uh, come on down here in chapter 18, in uh, verse 21, it brings out, uh, uh, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance for their service. And then it comes on down that the uh, Levites, in turn, uh, were to uh, uh, were to offer... The, uh, uh, were to take the tithes in uh, verse 26, and uh, they were to offer up a heave offering to the Lord, a tenth part of the tithe. In other words, the Levites received the tithe of all the other tribes, and then they, in turn, presented a tithe. Uh, they tithed also. They, they received the tithe, and then they tithed to the priesthood. And uh, so it was uh, the uh, uh, this principle here that is brought through. This is not the origin of tithing. You can go back to Genesis 14. Abraham tithed uh, to Melchizedek. Jacob knew about tithing. You remember when he was fleeing, he promised God, if you bring me back safely, I'll start tithing. Uh, amazing, you know, Jacob was going to even make a deal with God. Uh, people still try to do that sometimes. But uh, uh, tithing was an ongoing principle. Uh, here we find that God assigned it to the Levites because they were working for him. They were carrying out his uh, ministry at that time. Uh, as we come on down, the uh, uh, the water of separation, chapter 19 is the uh, chapter that deals with the red heifer, which was the uh, taken outside the camp, slaughtered and burned uh, to ashes. The ashes were mixed with water for the water of purification. This was the uh, the basis of, of all of the uh, purifying statutes. Uh, chapter uh, 20 uh, tells the story of uh, the death of Miriam. It also tells the uh, uh, the uh, matter here of, of uh, 
Moses uh, losing his temper and striking the rock, not following God's instructions and being told that uh, he would not be going into the promised land. We have the death of Aaron. Uh, let's uh, note here in chapter 22, we read, uh, we're introduced to Balaam. Now, the story of Balaam is a very interesting story. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of the details of it. I would encourage you to go back and read it. Uh, and when you do, you want to tie in a couple of a couple of other key sections in uh, the New Testament. In uh, Jude, verse 11, we read about those who ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Uh, back in uh, uh, the book of Revelation, in verse, chapter 2, verse 14, we read about those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. That was uh, the that was the doctrine of Balaam. The uh, what we find as you go through chapter beginning here in chapter twenty two, Balak, who was the uh, king of the Moabites, uh, saw these Israelites and he knew that it was going to take more than what he had to get rid of. So they sent to Balaam, who was, if you look on a map, Balaam lived a long distance away. He lived up on the northern Euphrates River, Pithor. He was obviously the chief pagan priest of the ancient world, and they needed a heavy-duty uh, fellow down there. So they sent presents. Balak loaded up all his, he sent some emissaries up there with presents for Balaam. Balaam wanted to come. We're told that Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. See, Balaam wanted to come. God told Balaam not to. So Balaam very sadly turned him down and told him, no, God wouldn't let him put a curse on Israel. So Balak decided, knowing Balaam, Balak decided they must not have offered him enough money. So he loaded up some more prestigious individuals, sent them back up there with a bigger offering, bigger, bigger money. Boy, Balaam's eyes lit up. He really wanted to go. And he knew that God didn't want him to go. God finally told him, he said, well, you can do what you want to. Boy, you can just see old Balaam's face lighting up. You know, God lets people do that today. God makes plain what he wants us to do, and then sometimes, you know, people keep, well, you know, I sure like to do that. And God says, well, you can do what you want to. Well, Balaam started out the next day, and he got a little ways down the road. You remember one of the funniest stories in the Bible, Balaam is here on his donkey on the way down the road, all of a sudden, the donkey stops. In fact, he has trouble with the donkey. The donkey, in one case, goes out in the field. In another case, he jams up against the rock wall and hurts Balaam's foot. And finally, he just stops and won't go any further. Then Balaam beat on him, and Balaam was so mad he didn't know what to do. And if you've ever dealt with a donkey, you realize how stubborn they can be. When they stop, they stop. And you can pull, push, just about do anything short of lighting a fire under them, and they just stay there. Uh... Finally, God just enabled this donkey to turn around and talk to Balaam. And the donkey said, you know, had not I been a good donkey? And Balaam said, well, you've been pretty good up until now. <laughs> and and uh, then God opened Balaam's eyes, and here was an angel standing there blocking the way. Now, the donkey obviously had more sense than Balaam did, because when the donkey saw the angel, the donkey had enough sense to stop. Balaam was looking for a way to get around the angel. In fact, the angel told Balaam, said, it's a good thing for you the donkey stop. I've got a sword here. If you'd come any closer, I'd lop your head off. Uh, but, you know, Balaam kept looking for a way. So God said, all right, you know, you can go. Balaam got down there. He wasn't allowed to pronounce a curse. Finally, Balaam came, Balaam came up with an idea. It's, the, it's most succinctly stated in Revelation 2. He taught Balak to cast a stumbling block. Balaam recognized that the only way he could that he could bring Israel under a curse, was he said, you know, there is a way we could get God to curse us. Have a party. Have the girls to invite them on down. 
you know, Israel became involved in, in uh, idolatry and, and fornication. They just had a real orgy down there. And the idea was, of course, that this would entice them into sin. And the doctrine of Balaam, there are those who are willing to do anything for a price. You see, they have run greedily after the error of Balaam. Uh, there are others, the, the, the doctrine of Balaam has to do with uh, enticement into enticing the people of God into things that are in violation of, of God's way and to compromise with the world. Idolatry, immorality, uh, with uh, fornication either in the literal physical sense or in the spiritual sense. A blending in, a, 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 a loss of their identity as a separate and holy people of God. Just, you know, becoming part of the world. And that's a serious matter. And God devotes several chapters here uh, to uh, uh, the matter of Balaam. And uh, uh, here, over a period of uh, several chapters, and finally you read the story that God sent a plague, and uh, one of Aaron's uh, uh, grandsons, Phineas, was a zealous individual. Uh, in fact, he, uh, uh, there was a, you know, things were so blatant. In chapter 25, verse 6, that one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren uh, a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, in the sight of the congregation. You know, this guy was just so absolutely blatant with it, nobody was going to tell him what to do. Phineas, Aaron's grandson, was so stirred up. He went and grabbed a javelin and uh, went running into the tent and just skewered him right to the ground. And uh, the plague was stayed. And uh, actually, uh, God said uh, from then on uh, that the priesthood would would come down, the high priesthood would descend through the family of Phineas. And that was, he was zealous for the Lord. Uh, and he evidenced that uh, that zeal. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a matter that uh, God saw a certain attitude, a certain zeal that, that he had that, that was good. Uh, the rest of the story is uh, told here in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, in, in, in terms of the matter of Balaam. We have the uh, question of inheritance brought up in chapter 27. Uh, the daughters of the uh, Zalatha had and uh, certain adjustments made. Then uh, we uh, find offerings uh, uh, spelled out here for the uh, festivals, the Sabbath and the festivals uh, here in Numbers chapter 28-29. Uh, chapter 30 uh, about vows. Uh, vows are not to be lightly made by anyone. Uh, we find that uh, uh, there were vows were to be taken. It was possible for a, a vow to be annulled. A woman who was single, still living at home in her father's household, uh, her father uh, could uh, annul her vow, uh, and if she were married, her husband could could do so. Uh, that. Uh, um, but uh, the uh, you know the vows are not to be lightly made, and um, it was uh, I think that 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 is something that we uh, uh, you know we see here the emphasis that that is placed on the sanctity. You make a promise, uh, and uh, God expects us to uh, you know follow through. We have. Uh, uh, more details here in terms of uh, uh, the uh, Balaam is slaughtered here with the uh, uh, with the uh, Midianites. We have the story here in chapter 31, and uh, Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh uh, receive their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. Uh, chapter 32. That is. Uh, uh, you know, that's brought out, and uh, the uh, one thing we might uh, note here in chapter 33 that helps answer the question of 
the distinction between the Passover and the night to be observed, we're told in uh, Numbers 33, verse 3, the children of Israel departed from Ramesses on the first month, on the fifteenth day of the first month, on the morrow after the Passover. The children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. Now, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that is lined out. Other scriptures show how that, uh, uh, back in Deuteronomy 16, 1, brings out that God brought them forth out of Egypt by night. Well, if he brought them out by night, he brought them out on the 15th, and he brought them out on the morrow after the Passover, then the Passover had to be on the night of the 14th, because at the night of the 15th when they came out, and it was the day after the Passover, then the night of the 14th was Passover. Uh, so these things, you know, line themselves uh, themselves up here. Uh, chapter, uh, as we come on down, chapter uh, uh, 35, we uh, find the uh, the the, uh, the set up. The Levites were given 48 cities. I think it's sort of interesting. Uh, the Levites, uh, these were the, the the Levites were the ones that uh, uh, administered the judicial system. Uh, uh, 40, 35 7, the Levites were given 48 cities uh, with their suburbs. I think it's sort of interesting. You know, the United States, uh, the continental United States, uh, there were 48 states, 48 administrative uh, uh, areas, if you will, uh, that uh, uh, in the, uh, the the continental inheritance, the, the sea to sea that God gave our people, sort of just a little interesting parallel. Ancient Israel was divided up into 48 uh, areas, or administrative areas, if you want to look at it that way, uh, each uh, city of the, Le- uh, each uh, one of these Levitical cities being the, uh, being the spot where the Levites were, were set up to, to uh, judge uh, those areas. The cities of refuge were set apart uh, here in uh, uh, chapter 35, certain Levitical cities. And uh, we find as we look here and compare the beginning of Numbers and the beginning of Deuteronomy, there was a period of, of uh, you know, just short of 39 years it's covered. Uh, we, we're right down Deuteronomy uh, 1 uh, brings us uh, to the 40th year in the 11th month. This is Deuteronomy 1, 3. And we found that... Uh, uh, so they're right down to the end of the 40th year, just short of the 40th anniversary. And the uh, numbers began just a little over a year after, about a year and a month after the Exodus, or a year, uh, actually about a year and two weeks after the Exodus uh, that, that is recorded back there. So you've got just approximately 39 years, almost 39 years. The whole story of Israel in the wilderness is given in the book of Numbers. Uh, it uh, We've had a chance just sort of to do a survey, but uh, uh, hopefully if you've not had opportunity to go back and study the book of Numbers yourself, uh, this will uh, prompt you to be able to go back through there and to uh, get from it some of the lessons that God would have us have today. So with that, we will be concluded uh, on the uh, book of Numbers, and I'll pass out 30 questions for next time, which will be the book of Deuteronomy.